good morning and uh, welcome to the class uh, so we finished our first unit which was about uh, uh, reproduction in animals plants uh, trying to find out why reproduction is important you know and when we saw that there is reproduction happening uh, you know generally you see that uh, the seeds are formed or the gametes are formed and these gametes will carry the genome and this genome gives all the characteristic of that particular organism right this is what we studied but how did we ever get to know that these gametes had uh, you know the genes now i say genes but what exactly are these genes okay uh, did we really know that these genes are in the form of a t g's and c's or uh, is there uh, any other kind of uh, you know uh, understanding of the molecular mechanisms behind all this so we did not know any of these and all this actually uh, started by one of uh, a very great uh, scientist who is uh, kind of gave an insight of how actually these gametes work and his name is gregor mendel johann gregor mendel he studied uh, the uh, inheritance patterns in uh, pea plants he found out why peas always give rise to peas plants and these peas plants again give rise to peas so he kind of did uh, a lot of studies on the inheritance patterns uh, of course at that time he did not know that they were called as genes he did not know that uh, you know the genes are in the form of at g and c it is uh, structurally made up of dna nothing was known in fact he called them as some small factors which are responsible to carry the information to carry the pattern of the some of the traits and uh, these factors uh, were considered to be the genetic material uh, and also the structural basis of genotype and the phenotype okay so this was done in our uh, by our mendel and after mendel proposed that there are certain small factors then came a revolutionary phase in the field of biology where people really wanted to find out what these factors are what is the nature of these factors uh, many scientists like watson crick corana then benzer uh, monod there are many of them who kind of try to find out how there is so much of similarity between the parent and their child so that this child is called as offspring in biology if you remember uh, you have learnt in your lower classes so what is the thing that brings about lots of similarities between the parent and the child so these factors were completely studied and was trying to be understood right and uh, at the same time almost at the same time uh, we also see that uh, there were lot of studies which were not focusing on the similarities but they were focusing on the differences between the organisms say for example uh, we are all humans but you see that no two human beings are just the same i am not just talking about uh, you know uh, the shape of a nose or the height or the color of the skin hair texture there are so many so many traits and all these traits you see that there is wonderful diversity and almost during this phase uh, there was also a lot of study that was being done to find out how these differences originate what makes this uh, you know organisms to completely uh, change uh, over a period of time from their parents okay so this kind of study of differences uh, was very very important obviously because these differences are the ones which keeps life going on in this planet and for the life to go on every organism should also change right we cannot expect human beings to be how he was 1 million years ago he was very happily roaming in the forest with one stick in the hand maybe trying to hunt animals eat raw meat or eat uncooked food 
i don't think we can live that kind of life for one day today right that is because though we have come from that kind of pre man you see that we are entirely different so we are similar yet we are different and in this particular unit which is called as the genetics and evolution we are going to discuss about uh, these important aspects in the first two chapters chapter 5 and chapter 6 we are going to talk about the principles of inheritance and variation so what brings about similarities what brings about changes how this inheritance is brought about what did mendel do what was his experimental design what was his uh, outcome of the result and after the outcome of the result how he pulled all the results to study uh, his own uh, idea okay and then how did he prove that so that is uh, the fifth chapter which is uh, in this unit the next chapter is something that we call as the molecular basis of inheritance where we talk about this particular factor its nature and many more yet we do not stop studying about this uh, unit uh, while just talking about inheritance we also talk about uh, some of the important principles that govern evolution so let us just start learning about the principles of inheritance and variation principles of inheritance and variation so in this particular chapter we are going to discuss about mendel uh, how the genes are inherited how the sex of the organism is determined and uh, what brings about some changes of of the offspring to the parent and also some of the genetic disorders so the first thing that we would all notice uh, is uh, you know i am sure you would have heard this uh, heard this very famous quote which he says as you so so you reap right i grow a mango plant and i can't expect you know jackfruit i grow a jackfruit and i can't expect mangoes right so whatever we sow that is what we reap same thing here even in the case of animals you see that always uh, humans give birth to humans a uh, fish is lay egg which hatch into fish okay a fish will not become a whale a whale will not become human that does not happen right now that is because of something that is there inside each and every organisms okay and not only that you would have also seen um, you know that uh, we all kind of resemble our parents our aunts our siblings do you see that yes uh, of course when you have a just born baby and you have many of them which are in one of the rooms it would be difficult to tell whose child is whose but as they grow you see that some of their features get matured some of their facial expressions will be so characteristic to that of their parents or the siblings or sometimes even the aunts right now this is uh, this has been a question mark from a very very long time in fact you know what this is a very crazy story that uh, during the aristotle's period or even before that people thought that you know a sperm would have a miniature human being inside him yes a sperm would have a very very small tiny 
microscopic human being in him and uh, when this uh, sperm is uh, entering the woman's body that woman's body nourishes this small child which is there in the sperm and then there is an infant that is born so this was the idea of how uh, you know sexual reproduction happens long 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 time back yes now we feel like laughing but yes uh, this was our uh, understanding of us uh, say about reproduction many years back but now uh, due to various works done by great scientists we have a separate branch of biology which is called as genetics the genetics is very very interesting subject because this talks about two important characteristics two important properties the first one is called as inheritance and the second one is something that we call as the variation it is called as the variation so these are the two things that are, are you know genetic studies so what is inheritance inheritance is something that comes from our parents our forefathers where it passed on it gets passed on from one generation to the next so we call that as inheritance so we have inheritance here at the same time genetics also talks about some of the differences between uh, two organisms say for example i have my sister now my sister is very much different from me okay be it in uh, height be it in color be it in the subject she studied the subject she loves many things okay at the physical level at the mental level you see that there are some differences now any organism also exhibits variation and yes we are studying about that variation as well in genetics okay uh, so uh, we know that uh, there has been a gradual evolution of sexual reproduction okay uh, in fact when we learned about that chapter i was telling you that all the animals and all the plants were uh, you know reproducing by asexual means okay it can be as simple as binary fission or vegetative propagation or things like that but now you see that uh, over a period of time sexual reproduction was something that was very very um, important now why was sexual reproduction important it was because they exploited some of the variations that were present okay some there were some changes very very small minute changes in the wild populations of say plants and animals and these small changes were selected uh, and these were bred and only such organisms which had some kind of uh, desirable characteristics were selected okay so this way you see that some genes were selected by nature and for this to happen it was always beneficial for the organism to undergo sexual reproduction right so this is how sexual reproduction started but it did not end there man was kind of highly uh, you know thoughtful if i can say that started with uh, agriculture now what he did was he tried to do something that we call as artificial selection where he tried to take out some special type of seeds special type of foods and uh, similarly domesticating certain kind of animals so he was trying to do all that uh, okay so and therefore these two also resulted like the artificial selection agriculture and domestication all these also recognized some of the very few species to be growing in higher numbers okay and uh, in fact that is the one which also led to the our better understanding of inheritance and variation so all this started uh, as a branch of biology because of the very famous scientists uh, you know um, quality work that was uh, given by uh, 
the scientists. So one of them is or the father I would say who started really working on this was Johann Gregor Mendel. So Johannes Gregor Mendel uh, he worked a lot and proposed a few laws of inheritance right. So let us learn about what was the Mendel's laws of inheritance. So, Johann Gregor Mendel was a child who was grown in a joint family, was forced to work quite early. Uh, basically, he was very good in uh, physics brain, had lot of logical reasoning and all of them. Uh, but because of uh, destiny, I would say, uh, he could not go and do physics, but uh, he worked as a pastor in uh, one of the churches and there he started uh, you know he was given the assignment of taking care of the plants and yes it was at this time that his logical brain his uh, mathematical analysis uh, a prior knowledge of statistics played a huge role to lay down the laws of inheritance okay now uh, the first thing that was observed was that you know there are many different types of pea plants. Now we all eat peas, we have seen a pea plant, uh, but yes, uh, Mendel noticed that there are some differences in their pea plants. Okay, uh, he also wanted to know what are the differences and why they are different. Now when Mendel observed the pea plants around him, the first thing was that he found out differences. Also, he noticed that some characters or some which we call in genetics as trait, okay, some traits uh, were in large numbers. Say for example, uh, like in humans we say, right, Germans are considered to be very, very tall. That is because of that particular nature that they have in them right so here he found out that amongst pea plants there are some traits which was seen uh, more than the rest so based on that he found out that there are certain characters which are called as traits and out of these traits some of them are seen in large numbers which we call as the dominant trait Please do remember here, here the dominant trait means that these are the traits that are seen in large numbers. Okay? I will give another definition for dominant trait after some time or maybe you will be able to understand it by yourself once we go further understanding about the chapter. And the one which was seen in smaller numbers, he called it as the recessive trait. So, what are the different traits that Mendel observed? That is the first interesting question. Uh, the first one was, uh, you know, the flower color. Okay. You see the flower color. The flower color was seen in two different colors. One was the violet color and the other one was white color. So, there were two colors, violet and white so now you know what is dominant and what is recessive. Okay, violet was dominant, white was recessive. And then there was the seed color. Again, you see that most of the seeds were yellow, but very few of them were also green. And the seed shape, the seed shape was round and in few of them it was wrinkled and not only please do not think that these were the only three differences there were another four more differences 
there were four more differences. There was something that we call as the pod shape. Right, I'm sure you know that this piece comes in pods. And yes, the pod shape was either full and inflated. Okay, we call it as full or we call it as the inflated pod or it was constricted. So, there were uh, two types of pods there. Again, talking about the pod color, there were again two types. One was green, then the other one was yellow. So, the pod color was different and the flower position also was different. Flower position, flower position was axial or terminal and as such the plant itself okay plant itself was either tall or dwarf now most of the plants that we see around also exhibit many such small minute differences but yes we would not be able to really observe them but Mendel really observed them very well. And one more best thing about uh, Mendel's luck was that he chose this pea plant. Imagine if he has taken mango tree. Now for the mango tree to grow and study all these characteristics, I am sure, uh, you know, one birth is not enough, right? So you see that uh, there is lot of, lots and lots of uh, uh, chains that you can study, lots and lots of cycles that you can study in a very short period of say 3 months or 6 months, you see that the entire life cycle of the pea plant gets over. So, he can kind of study generations and generations and generations and come out with his own law of inheritance. So, that was Mendel's uh, first luck. The second luck was he chose pea plants and apparently later genetics uh, geneticists found out that all these uh, traits are situated in uh, different places. So, there is nothing like you know uh, mixing up of characters. So, if by chance he had taken any other plant then it would have been uh, slightly difficult. So, that was also kind of stopped uh, in the case of Mendel and the third and the foremost uh, trait for which Mendel has to be really appreciated is his highly large sampling size. Any idea of how many plants he studied during his uh, lifetime? He studied uh, close to he studied close to around eighteen thousand plants. Okay, 18,000 plants and for each one of them, his observation skills were so good that for each of them, he had written height, weight and all the seven characteristics, uh, try to find out what happened in the first generation, what happened in the second generation, what happened in third generation, what if I take the third generation and cross it with the first. So, he did lots and lots of studies and had huge data, huge data. Okay. And when he started studying this and wrote one paper and gave it, you know, people just wanted to outrightly reject that because of two things. The first thing was that all these were diverse natural observations, but there is lot of complexity and he had tried to put them in very simple terms. Uh, so, how can one write that way? That was the first thing. The second important uh, thing that was th thought was like, you know, how can biology be explained using mathematics or say statistics? That was again, which was not very well uh, appreciated long time back. And then, then, you know, it was rejected. But later, people really understood what uh, is the value of these studies. And later, he was given uh, called as the father of genetics, right? Uh, he is also considered to be one of a major uh, 
a person who is brought about artificial pollination and cross pollination experiments he was the first scientist to who has done cross pollination and artificial pollination to see that this would be the type of the plant that he would get okay earlier yes there was hybridization techniques but those hybridization techniques were all kind of you know uh, trial and error method whereas this was done in so systematic way that uh, over a period of time people really found out which plants has to be crossed to get what kind of characters so all these were studied very well in uh, studied by mendel and then comes our uh, crates okay now to understand more about mendel's laws of inheritance let us talk about inheritance of one gene so we were we are not going to study all the seven differences that was mentioned to you we will take one gene for our uh, study and we are going to study about one gene inheritance okay now uh, mendel you know he did some kind of pollination artificial pollination cross pollination where he kind of chose the pollen he also chose the gynoecium he selected them and he tried to cross them okay now this was done by mendel himself right now in the first instance okay in the first instance uh, what he did was he took one tall plant and he took one dwarf plant right he took one tall plant and he took one dwarf plant now these two plants were considered to be the parents right we call them as the parents so we we'll write it as p1 generation or we also call it as p1 standing for the parent parental so there are the parent plants the parental plants he chose the plants with contrasting characters okay now please note that these selection of tall and the dwarf plants were chosen such that if by chance i allow this tall plant to undergo self pollination i hope you know what is self pollination if the anther of the same plant or the same flower falls on the gynoecium stigma of the same flower and then there is seed formation we call it as uh, you know self pollination right uh, so if the tall plants after self pollination gives only to tall plants such tall plants were taken as one of the parent and similarly if there is a dwarf plant and if this dwarf plant uh, undergoes um, growth and uh, if it succeeds gives rise to only dwarf plants so they were considered as one parent so what he did was he tried to take these two as the parent and then he did a artificial pollination now what did he do in artificial pollination was in one of the plants he tried to emasculate them emasculation is basically a process where all the pollen grains are cut off there is only this female reproductive part of the flower and in the other he kept uh, only the male okay he took the male pollen which were uh, completely matured and he put it on the style here now when this was done okay when the dwarf uh, thing was done uh, dwarf pollen was put on the tall plants okay obviously they were crossed and then there was seeds that were obtained right now these seeds if we take those seeds and we put them 
and saw them, he observed that all the plants were tall. Okay, the plants coming out of the cross between the tall and the dwarf, all of them were tall. Now, when all of them were tall, he was like wondering, what happened to the dwarf plant? Where did it go? It has to be somewhere. Where did it go? Big question mark. Now, when uh, he was kind of confused, he allowed them to kind of undergo a self-pollination, right? He allowed them to undergo uh, self-pollination and when he allowed them to undergo self-pollination, again you see that there were plants which were tall and then came one more type of plant which was a dwarf. So, it did not resemble the parent, but it resembled the grandparent in this case. So, tall was there and dwarf was also there. And the best part was that around 75 percent were tall and around 25 percent of them were dwarf. Right? So, this made him to think a lot uh, of how exactly the gene or how exactly is you know the trait being passed on. Okay? And then he said that all these plants have something that we call as factors. Right now, we call the same factors as genes. Okay? We call them as genes. And he said that anything that is present in larger numbers or anything that we observe in the first generation between a cross of two contrasting characters, we call that as a dominant factor. Okay? Now, in the case of the anthers and the seeds, you see that uh, only one uh, In case of uh, the gametes, there are only haploid genes, right? Of haploid factors, only one copy of that, and hence he tried to find out what would happen if there is a, both the factors present together or different, and so on. So, based on that, he also explained some of the terms that we very, very widely use now. Okay, so let us just start off with uh, understanding the parent generation in, see in this case, one was tall and one was dwarf. Now, these characters are the characters which I can see from my naked eye, right? These are the physical traits that are uh, present. So, these are called as the phenotype. So, phenotype basically means that it is the trait that is seen by our physical senses. I can touch it, I can smell it or I can see it. So, that is what we call as the phenotype. Now, all the phenotypes arise from something that is there inside the cell, right? And this something which is there inside the cell is the factors. And these factors which we cannot see directly but I can see it only as a phenotype is what we call as the genotype, right? Now, in the case of tall plants, the plants had a genotype of capital T, capital T and then a dwarf plant since it is shorter, we write it as small t and the small t, right? So, we have the phenotype and then we have the genotype. Please do remember that this is the diploid condition and we know that in gametes there is meiosis happening, right? So, in the case of meiosis, whatever we have it here, it will be exactly halved, right? So, this will have a capital T and this will have a small t. This will have a small t, right? Uh, 
I am writing only one gamete here, but please do remember in meiosis we have so many gametes that are produced. One writing here does not mean it produces only one gamete. It just means to say with respect to the tall gene, all the gametes are of same type, which is all having capital T present in them. Whereas in the case of war plants, all of them will have a small t. Okay. Now when these two come together, this is not meiosis. Sorry. Then when these two come together, there is the first generation of spring. Now the first generation of spring is what we call as F1 generation. F1 means filial. Filial means offspring. First filial means first generation of spring. Right? So, that is our F1 generation. So, I hope you have understood all these terms. Right? Now, what will be the F1 generation? We know that for F1 generation, these two would come together and fuse. So, there would be the formation of a plant which is having one capital T and one small t. Now, don't you think that there is one capital T, one small t and these two should become medium sized plant? Now, that does not happen. All the plants in F1 generation were tall in phenotype. Now, they are tall because you know this behaves as a leader. It does not allow this capital T to express at all. So, this is kind of not uh, expressed whereas capital T is expressed. So, we have capital T and small t and when there are two of different traits like that present together, different factors for one trait present together, you see that only one of them which is the dominant character is what expressed. So, this tall is dominant because their numbers are more and also in the F1 generation only tall plants are observed. Right? Now, here I would like to use uh, one more in term. In these two cases, in the parental cases, they are the two factors are the same. Yes? Now, such a condition is what we call as the homozygous condition. We call that as the homozygous condition. Whereas in the F1 generation, please do remember this is also this is also tall plant, this is also tall plant. This is tall because both the gametes are expressing the same trait. This is tall because the dominant trait is the only one which is getting expressed. So this parental gene parental factor is what we call as the homozygous condition and in the F1 generation we call that as the heterozygous condition. Right? So, this way he was observing the first generation and he realized that there is some kind of mismatch happening here and that led him to carry out one more test where he crossed I would erase this part where he he uh, try to find out the second parent generation. I told you that he selfed these stalls. So there was capital T small t crossed with capital T small t, right? So that was selfed. Now when these two plants were selfed, then came our let us write the gametes for this please do remember there are so many gametes formed and there are two types of gametes one which has capital t one which has small t and same type of gametes are produced here as well right now let us see their progeny now this will not be the first generation this will be the second generation now this is second generation he saw that this gamete can get fused with this gamete okay, or it can get fused with this gamete right. Similarly, this two can get 
involved in the syngamy and finally there are four possibilities of the fusion of the gamete. So, in the first one there would be capital T capital T capital T small t this would be small t capital T which can also be written as capital T small t both are the same ok and then there would be one homozygous dwarf plant. So, this is how it should be. So, this is let us write the phenotype here you will see that three of the plants are tall, tall, tall and tall and one of them is dwarf ok and when we are talking about the genotype we say the ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1 homozygous dominant, heterozygous tall and then there is homozygous dwarf. So, this is how uh, you know the factors get inherited when we are studying only about one gene right. So, he tried to do all this and uh, he made some observations ok. He made some observations and those observations were is what we call as the monohybrid cross ok. We call that as the monohybrid cross and uh, he proposed one law for this which is called as law of dominance ok. It is called as law of dominance or law of segregation ok. The first thing that this law says is that all the characters and all the traits are characterized by factors. Now, all the factors they are present in pairs ok. Now, if they are dissimilar you see that one pair always dominates the other. Now, this is what he called as the law of dominance ok and then he also proposed one more law which is called as the law of segregation. Now, according to this law of segregation uh, you, you see that you know there are suppose there are these two characters you see that there is no blending of the characters ok. The blending is not happening in the next generation when they become parents you see that each one of them behave individually and give a completely own trait as it had earlier ok. So, this is what we call as the law of segregation. Uh, let us learn more about uh, how good this uh, trait is and why we write this particular ratio and all that. Uh, in our next class and also learn about one factor which is called as the incomplete dominance ok. I hope you do not have any doubts, any doubts make a note we will discuss in our live class. See you then.